know, about this time of the year, there are still some of our Roman Catholic friends that celebrate a feast day known as Corpus Christi, or the Body and Blood of Christ. And in some countries, such as Ireland, not that long ago, a heavily Catholic country, this is an important celebration, and in many rural towns and villages, uh, the priests would take the, the Holy Eucharist, and they would have a parade through the streets, and, and the, the choir boys would lead the procession ringing bells, and so the families would come out of their houses for the procession, and kneel on their knees and cross themselves as the body and blood of Christ went through town. Uh, a priest here in this country tells of a family that had just moved from Ireland. In fact, they were still unpacking their boxes. And as they were unpacking, they, they heard bells ringing. And so they just stopped what they were doing and they rushed out of the house they went to the front yard and they kneeled down just in time for the good humor truck to go down the street. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it might have been a religious procession. <laughs> for some people, ice cream is a sacrament. <laughs> but let's talk for just a moment about the power of tradition. Mark tells us the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law had come to Jerusalem, were gathered around Jesus, and they spotted something that offended them. Some of Jesus' disciples were eating their food without first ceremonially washing their hands. Well, you know, this wasn't about hygiene. You know, they, they didn't know anything about germs and <coughs> viruses back then. The interesting thing, though, is that some of the, the dietary laws did protect the, the children of Israel from, from disease. However, in this case, it, 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 it was all about religious ceremony. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, well, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating food with defiled hands? That's a good question. Why didn't the disciples keep this tradition? They, like Jesus, were devout Jews. We, we see other places where they are observing the traditions of faith. Why not this one? Maybe it was just a teaching moment, I don't know. Remember their fondness for tradition. Well, maybe it's one of the reasons why Jewish communities have survived. Through much of their history, the Jewish people have, have been a persecuted minority scattered about across the globe. And their traditions served as a key ingredient in maintaining their identity. This was the way they could demonstrate their Jewishness. So, so fathers would teach their sons, and, and, and mothers would pass on the traditions to their daughters. And as we know, there, there were special laws for diet, for, for relationships within the family, and for relationships outside the house. And all of it made for a vibrant and cohesive community. So while traditions are important to maintaining a faith community, What happens when those people of faith hang on to the rituals but begin to lose that covenant relationship with God? And that's a serious question. That's way more than 
just kneeling in the front, front yard for the good humor truck. The epistle of James carried on the work of teaching how the faith must be put into action, lived out. How do we demonstrate a clean heart? Well, we say our actions speak louder than our words. And James wrote this letter to Jewish Christians who were caught up in, in the social tensions of, of mid-first century life. There were outbreaks of violence and insurrection taking place in Jerusalem. In fact, it would all culminate into, into a, a, a military conflict between Judea and, and the Roman Empire from 66 to 70 AD. In fact, the whole Roman world was dealing with unrest, economic problems, food shortages, the rapid turnover of Roman emperors led to erratic government policy for Christians and Jews and others. And so the stakes were raised. So it's even more important to know what it meant to be clean on the inside and not to simply follow tradition. Well, the problem before the church in this time of uncertainty can be summed up something like this. How do we remain a faithful Christian community in the midst of a time of trial and temptation? My goodness, maybe our time isn't that different. <laughs> we can still ask the same question today. Well, James wrote to encourage his brothers and sisters to give them some instruction on how to navigate through difficult times. So first, faithfulness must be practiced. The letter reads like a, you know, a series of, of instructional videos. Us. Instructional videos on, on the Christian life. And in this section, James made clear that no amount of instruction matters unless you put it into practice. You can come to church every week. You can read books and books and books. But if you don't put that instruction to practice, it doesn't matter. James wanted the church to become experts not only in hearing the instruction, but doing what was instructed as well. In today's language, Christians are reminded, you know, that our children are watching us. Well, maybe, maybe now it's we're reminded that the unchurched are watching us because they want to see how people of faith live. So maybe we're the only Jesus some people might see. Our actions speak louder than our words, especially when our actions and our words don't line up. Faithfulness will often be challenged or tested. For James, this time of testing, well, it wasn't something that God had thrown down as an extra burden or to test, you know, how obedient the people of God are trying to break them. But rather, it's a gift that God has given to the people. A chance for them to shine in the midst of the darkness so that the world could see that they were a new creation. A new creation in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. So faithfulness is, 
is rooted in the trustworthiness of God. You know, in the Greco-Roman world, there were many people who consulted astrology and the alignment of the stars. We, we think we invented the New Age movement. It's been around forever. The, 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 these practices would help them determine their, their course of action. But James called the church to remember that they had been given the perfect gift of God, the Father of the lights, and that the one who actually created the stars in the first place so unlike the changeable nature of events in the present world, there is no variation due to change, no shadow of change in God's nature. So God and the Word of God are the only reliable sources of information for the church. We're having some conflicts in our society about where you get reliable news. But for the church, it's always been the same. It is the word of God. And that word created, created us to live in fulfillment of God's purpose. And that we as Christians, as a church, are birthed by the word of truth. So this faithfulness that comes out of the word of truth it is grounded, is grounded in God's word. So with that word of truth in mind, James then turns to the problem at hand and lays down a quick take on how to manage ourselves in a world that just seems to be spinning out of control. You know, it, it's tempting. It's tempting, ever so tempting to give in to anger and revenge and nasty words. And while there's a ton of instructional material that we can learn from on the internet, Oh my gosh, there are so many other folks that are just spewing and ranting venom about other people, about a cause, about an issue. And James would say, this is like trying to deal with a problem without first taking time to, to read the instruction manual. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Oh man, that's, that's short, but man, it packs so much in there. Let everybody be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Boy, it, it made a whole lot of sense then, and they didn't even have Twitter. <laughs> Think how, 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 how much more quickly we react and overreact now. James instructs his brothers and sisters to get rid of that kind of reactivity and to instead welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. The same word of truth that gives new birth also guides the words and actions of the one whom God has saved. Well, there, there's a Japanese legend of, uh, about a man who died and, and he's taken up to heaven and he's walking around and, he, and it's beautiful, lush, beautiful gardens, glittery, mansions that he's he's walking around giving oriented to eternity and, and he noticed there's this room that has all these shelves big shelves from the floor to the ceiling and, and there's nothing on these shelves but ears 
years and years and years and years. Fortunately, he has a spiritual guide that explains things to him. And the heavenly guide explains that these ears belong to all the people on earth who listened each week to the word of God, but never acted on God's teachings. There never was any action that came from their worship. So when these people die, only their ears went to heaven. Huh. Faithfulness puts words into demonstrable and visual, visual action. So how does the word get activated? In one's life. James says you have to practice it. Be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. Oh, I like that. They make a great t-shirt. Be doers. <laughs> if I say You know, you know, we just don't want to fill up shelves with ears, right? Yeah, there's probably plenty of those. The, the, the purpose of receiving instruction is to receive the word of truth and then to put it into action. You know, talked about looking in a mirror, but, you know, we, we can learn how to do anything on YouTube. You don't even have to have stacks of car manuals or things anymore. You can just look it up on YouTube. So it, it, if I have a sink that leaks, it, and my plumbing skills are bad, I, I, I'd get my YouTube and I'd find a, a video and I'd watch the video. And if I watch the video, it's like, oh yeah, that looks easy. And then I just never did anything about it. <laughs> the sink is still going to leak. I need to watch the video again and stop it and have my tools and do that part and then watch some more and finish the whole project if it's going to make any sense. You know, we, we sometimes do the same thing with our faith. You know, I know it sounds judgmental, but it doesn't keep it from being true. Many people who call themselves Christians don't follow Jesus at all. So do we seek after his love, his compassion, and his commitment to a better life for all people? Or are we satisfied with looking like a Christian. Just keeping up the traditions of faith. You know, tradition can be a wonderful thing. There are traditions that I, that I, I love. But it becomes destructive when we use it as a means to just looking like a follower of Jesus and say, we don't actually have to follow him. How about you? Where is God? Is God at the, the center of your heart? Is Jesus the one who determines your attitude towards others? Or do we simply use Jesus as an excuse to have an attitude towards others? Oh. You know, th th this is a good verse that kind of bridges us from John to James. You know, if, if you look at 1 John 4, 8, it reads, Whoever does not love doesn't know God, because God is 
love. Does that mean something to you? Does that get you charged up when you're, you read that, when you hear that? Can you honestly say that you know the God whose name and nature is love? Or is God simply on your lips and not in your heart? It leaves you a lot to think about. Are you ready? We're going to come to the Lord's table soon. And as we do get our hearts ready, I invite you to turn to 402 and sing, Lord, I want to be a Christian.